All right, it has been a very difficult few weeks, uh, obviously with a lot of the racial injustice going around and a lot of other things that we want to get into. Uh, first of all, I, my name is Christian Jack from TSN. This is a show that I've quite frankly wanted to do for a very long time, not just for a couple of weeks. So first of all, I want to thank TSN for that opportunity. But above all else, I want to thank the three gentlemen who have spent some time with me today to talk more about this. Richie Larea, Toronto FC defender. Good to see you again, Richie. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for, for having me today. Thank you for joining me, Mark Anthony Kay from LAFC Midfielder. I know we spoke about a few other things on the field, but this is far more important. So I thank you again for spending some time with me today. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And Jeremy Abiba say this is the first time you and I have chatted over any kind of interview. So I appreciate you joining the conversation as well. Good to see you, Jeremy. How are you? Yeah, likewise, uh, up and down, but uh, happy to be here and happy to be talking about, you know, some some rather serious conversations. Yeah, let's have those serious conversations. And when I obviously throw that words, those words around, how are you? A lot of the times, you know, people just say, how are you? How are you? I really now don't want to just make it about how are you? I want to welcome you and figure out how you are. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I can't, as a white privileged man, understand any of this, but I want you to know that I stand with the three of you gentlemen. I stand on the side of justice and I want to listen and I want to learn and I know I speak for many people out there. So. That's the purpose of this, and I, you know, hopefully we can learn a few things today and have those conversations, meaningful conversations, to not just have today, but going forward. So again, um, let's have those deep dive conversations. Jeremy, I'll talk to you about that first, if you don't mind. You said you're up and down. How has the last couple of weeks been for you emotionally in the last, obviously, in the wake of, of, of you know, the death of George Floyd? It's been stressful. Um, there's been a lot of grief and, and despair uh processing what happened you know i refused to watch the video it was, it was too hard for me to to deal with uh it, it's a cycle that you know we're, we're all very used to as black americans knowing that you know that could be us at some point uh, and that we have to tread carefully and so the despair comes from uh the inability to have conversations with my friends throughout these years my close my close circles have been very supportive and very good uh through the little disagreements that we've had you know they've still continued to grow and and that's been amazing uh but teammates uh people in, in class uh you know maybe loose acquaintances they, they haven't quite gotten it and you know now they they are are telling us that this is the moment that it's it's enough and and enough is enough you know which makes me question why the previous incidents which i know at least in my area got national attention um, why those weren't enough and so it's been about juggling whether you know they're, they're genuine or not or whether they are trying to be a part of the movement you know on social media to reassure the public and themselves that you know that they are they are on the right side of this uh, so so it's been a lot but uh, I would say that the last few days have been a little bit more positive than the beginning great to hear about the last couple of days that can I hear your your concerns I can completely understand that um, Mark Anthony, let's go out to you. And obviously in Los Angeles, you were part of some of the protests as well and the peaceful protests. How's the last few weeks been for you and how was that experience for you out there? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks, considering everything that's gone on this year with the whole pandemic, I think, you know, it's just hit a high and uh, emotional um, strain on, on everyone, you know. Um, like kind of what Jeremy talked about talked about it. it's like things that are happening now have always been happening and maybe because now we're, we're stepping up and we're we're creating more noise around it like I, I do stand with him a little bit when I feel I don't know how genuine a lot of people are when they feel like they're talking about this movement and being behind you know Black Lives Matter I, I feel like like he said like it's you know it's easy to just hop on it on social media and then act like you've you know, you've done your part. So um, it's definitely been eye-opening. Um, I'm glad to see so many people come together during the protest. Obviously, there's a lot of, you know, violence that was not associated with the message we were trying to create. And, you know, a lot of people did get hurt standing up for something that was right. So on that part, it was sad to see. But, you know, every day when there's a protest, you know, it just it gives me more and more hope that, you know, more people will get behind us and start to create a better better world for everyone. I do want to address that in a minute, the, 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 whether it's, uh, I think Jeremy used it in his wonderfully written piece, 
I think you used the word fad. We'll get into that in a minute, whether it is that and what we can do to move that discussion forward. But Rich, I want to give you an opportunity to talk to our viewers about the how thoughts have been for you with your emotions over the last couple of weeks. I know you and I on a different platform have had a bit of a chat about this as well, but how have things been for you with your family? And I know obviously being a dad, this is a little bit different for you. Yeah, it's um extremely stressful time for, for a lot of us. So I know me and you spoke already and being a dad and having my dad have this conversation with me uh, a numerous amount of years ago, I'm also going to have, have this conversation with my son uh, one day as well. So that's been pretty taxing on me and it's um cost me to lose some sleep because it's uh honestly horrific what's happening um, in, the, in the States right now, but it's not only the States. I know it's, uh, it's a global problem. So, yeah, I'm with I'm with Jeremy as well. I, I um, love the outpour of support from everyone, and um, it's great. But uh, I just hope to see all of this stuff stick. Um, when a push comes to shove, and this is a month or two or three away, I need to see the same um, energy and passion that people are showing now. I need to see that um, in three months from now because. Like I, I think I said it to you. Um, like it's not for black people alone to fight this fight. Um, a lot of the um, white people and whatever other races it is, they also need to lend us a helping hand in this because we need everyone to get to ultimately fight this as best as we possibly can. Yeah, well, well said. Look, it's not a time for anybody to be silent. You know, for me, th this is a moment where, you know, no one cares what I think. They're here to listen to you. But, I, you know, we use every breath we can to get the message out there. Now, next month, next year, let's continue this discussion. Um, you know, I'm passionate about that in the small medium that I have, and I know you guys are as well. Uh, you know, Jeremy, is there something over the last few days when you said that you are positive that you're starting to believe that this is more than just a fad? I know the scenes we're seeing in the United States with the protests and the peaceful protests, and it's so wonderful to see crowds come together for a wonderful cause. It's, it's quite unique. It is, it is a, a, a lot of people have said something they didn't think they'd ever see that. Do you believe there's something in this movement, this motion, that it, it, it feels different, that can hear, that is here to stay? Yeah, I think there there are some some positives that we haven't seen uh, in the past. As I said, a lot of the, the previous killings have gotten national attention. Uh, some of them have gotten, you know, their protests, whether they were for a few days or a few weeks, uh, uh, they had their moment as well. And then ultimately things returned to normalcy, uh, which was disappointing because I know, you know, the three of us on this call didn't return to normal. Uh, it, it stayed with us uh, until the next one and the next one. And then the countless others that, you know, aren't getting the attention uh, because either they didn't die or because they weren't recorded. Um, but but there is something a little bit different here. Uh, and I think namely the international support uh, has been uh, incredible, honestly. You know, I'm, I'm seeing protests in Germany. I'm seeing protests in England. I'm seeing protests in France. And, you know, I'm seeing them kind of come to grips with, you know, some of their historical challenges as well. Uh, whether we're talking about a statue in London being taken down uh, from, I think, a, a former British slave trader, uh, that, you know, why, why are these people still being uh, memorialized? Uh, we have that issue with the, in this country, too, with the Confederate, uh, Confederate monuments. Uh, and so ultimately what put pressure on the civil rights movement uh, was that open casket with Emmett Till uh, and the national and worldwide attention that it got, uh, what put pressure on apartheid in South Africa as well was the national attention that it received or international attention that it received among other factors as well. Uh, and so if, if this can sustain and, you know, locally I've been noticing the protests have been growing by the day. Uh, the, the organizers have been more and more organized and more and more passionate and bringing more and more important messages. Um, if this can be sustained and people don't burn out because this is a marathon, then this this could be the tipping point, but you know, uh, for my own emotions, I need to uh, maintain a level head, uh, just so that I'm not disappointed if it isn't the case. Because a lot of people are new to are new to activism, uh, and so I don't want them to get bored of it. Because I I do believe now that more people than I expected are genuine. I just don't know if they know what's required. It's very fair. Uh, Mark Anthony, you were obviously within the protests in Los Angeles. To Jeremy's point, you know, being in the media, I know that the average news cycle lasts about a week. 
You know, we're two weeks yeah. away from the senseless killing of George Floyd. We're, we're one week gone since the blackout on social media. Here we are right now still talking about it in our own small medium. How are you feeling about that? And, and how did you feel maybe when you walked in your, your living space there where you live after it? And you, what, when you had to decompress and what you just witnessed, did you feel something different at all? You know, uh, this was my first time being a part of something like this, you know, and being, you know, on the ground level, seeing the raw emotions of everyone who's participating in these protests. And, um, you know, people are upset, people are mad. And I think it's, it's long overdue. And, you know, what I can remember briefly from history is like all these other protests, a lot of them were just they're not they weren't as diverse as they are now you know and i think more people are understanding that it's not right and they're getting a part of it and i'm seeing so many different communities and ethnicities and races out there and that was just something to know that it was nice to know that people understand that this is like an us problem it's like a world problem it's not just okay let the black people go protest and fight for what is right it was like no we can't stand by and i think that's the biggest thing i think like jeremy said it's going to be a marathon it's going to be long it's not going to change in three months four months five months it's going to be a, a ever lasting battle to get you know systematic racism change police brutality change this is just the beginning and it, it's just nice to see people so passionate but I still think there's a side of education that needs to come out with it. You know, I think going to a protest isn't enough. I think posting on your social media is not enough. I think you need to understand what the black community faces on day to day to understand how to fight for them. You know, it's easy to follow. You know, a lot of us in the world are followers, but if we need everyone to be an individual and lead, like I said, we all have a circle of influence. We all have to influence that circle. And the only way we can do that is through education and then speaking up continuously over a while. So, uh, no, it's, I, I'm, like I said, I'm proud. And when I was part of the protest, uh, you know, a bunch of the LAFC supporters led one. Um, you know, I, I told them before, like, I, I'm proud to walk with them. I'm proud because they understand their need in this fight and to take the time. To, to fight for something that doesn't concern them um, just shows the how genuine they are. So, um, yeah, it's been good, but it's a, it's a long battle. There's a lot of people in power that we need to overturn before we can start seeing results. Let, let me follow up with you there. You said something that would stuck with me, well, everything you stuck with was stuck with me, but you said people need to understand what you guys go through. You wrote a very emotional and powerful letter um, to the country that is obviously your home right now on with LAFC. And I want to read a little bit of a quote for that. You said, quote, I want to live in a world where I do not have to fear for my life when I go outside, when I don't, where I don't ha have to pray that I can simply return home safe and sound. And the next bit actually brings me to tears the first time I, I saw this. Why should I feel more scared about my life than my white teammates? And when I read that as a white privileged man, that is, it, you know, it's, that's something that I'm having discussions with my children right now. It, it, it's it's extremely difficult to hear. You know, we all come into the world the same and we all leave the world the same. Um, yet that, those words are extremely powerful and I give you a lot of credit for saying those. When, when you go through that, and it is obviously a daily battle, it's now important, Mark Anthony, is it not, that more and more people are understanding that, that they're not just reading those words and we're having this discussion, not just today, but next year, next month, next, whenever, going forward, that this is a daily battle for you and other people. Yeah, it needs to stick in their head. It's It sucks, man. Like, I'm not going to, you know, not be truthfully honest about it. It's It sucks. Like, I even had an experience, you know, today leaving my, my, uh, my house for training. And there were two cop cars or two motorcycles, cops on motorcycles. And, you know, th there is a sense of panic in that situation. I've done nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong. But I'm thinking, what are the chances that, like, they will pull me over for no reason? You know what I mean? And the only thing that I think that will get me out of this situation is the fact that I'm wearing my LAFC gear, you know? Because it's like, I, it's, I don't know why, maybe it's just me, but every time I pass a cop, I feel like I need to know exactly where everything is in my car. 
my driver's license, my registration, everything. Because it's like, if I'm off by one chance, it can create a huge problem. And it sucks to live in fear like that. And I'm glad that people are starting to understand it, but it's a long way. It's a long way. And you just, like I said, you have to educate yourself on it because if you don't go through it, you might play it down. But it, it's real and it happens to all of us. And Richie, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. Sorry, I just want to piggyback off that. Um, you, you, Mark talks about education and, it, and it's so, it's so crucial because people are going to want to separate what happened to George Floyd uh, and police brutality, which are inexplicable and awful. Uh, but they're going to try and separate that with the rest of the systemic injustice that we have across all our industries. And so that's what's important to educate themselves about as well, because ultimately, you know, it, it's not the racist, you know, policeman who, who kills someone that's that's the only person killing us because ultimately when I'm walking to yoga class from my apartment, not, not looking like a threat at all, walking in broad daylight and someone makes an intentional turn just to avoid walking past me because I'm so much of a threat in that setting, it's that collect. And then they get right back on that straight path right after uh, it's that setting that uh, is creating mentality that spreads among, you know, non-black people uh, and so that setting is replicated in our classrooms in corporate america wherever it is uh it's reinforcing this this mindset that black people aren't there to be productive members of society but rather are the lowest of the low and are in and it takes away that empathy when we do have issues um so so education is, is crucial uh, and it starts with our kids uh, and as they grow up, but adults, ourselves included, have, have a long way to go as well. Richie, let me turn to you. Jeremy talked earlier about the international support that he's seen. Obviously, Jeremy, born in France, now living in Portland. Mark's a Canadian, now living in L.A., uh, representing LAFC. You're obviously Canadian back in Canada now, but you've been in Orlando as well. I think, is it important for Canadians as well, Richie, that they understand that this is not something that's just happening away from their, their country? It, the, it happens here and that there's a massive difference that they can make. This is not just a United States problem. This is a social life human being issue. Yeah, this is, uh, it's, a, it's a global issue. This isn't just happening in the, in the States. This is worldwide. And, you know, like sometimes I sit here and, it, and it's funny to me, not because I'm, I'm laughing at the situation, but it's like we aren't asking to be put on a pedestal. We're just asking for equality. We want to be treated with some respect. So sometimes I sit here and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, we're, we're not asking for much. It's not, um, I'm not asking you to put me on this hierarchy and leave me there and I'm above everyone else. It's no, everyone just wants to be treated with the exact same respect as, um, for example, a white person would be, um, you know, but yeah, you hit it on the, on, the, on the nose there because I've had conversations with American people. I've had conversations with uh, Canadian people. It's not, it's, it's not non-existent uh, here in Canada. I see it still. Um, I see some racial profile in like um, Jeremy and Mark said as well, those same incidents I encountered in the States, I encounter them here. Maybe not as frequent, but it, it still happens. So Again, ed education, I'm going to harp on that as well because it is so important because um, I'm not going to lie to you, leading into Orlando, I didn't, um, I, I knew about racism, but not what I know uh, now since being in Orlando because I remember incidents, my first probably uh, major racial lesson uh, um, towards me was I went to a mall in Orlando, probably one of the first days after being drafted and a very good female friend of mine and I went to, uh, to the mall and she's a, she's a white uh, girl, American. And she told me, she's like, Hey, before we go in, uh, I'm just going to give you a, a quick heads up. Like people are going to look at this and I'm like, well, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, is it because I just got drafted or people going to recognize me? Like, um, what's the deal here? and then she was just like, no, no, it's because you're black and I'm white and people aren't used to seeing, um, people like us uh together and i was like okay that's uh very strange to me because in, in canada i've seen i know of multiple people in interracial relationships so then we stepped foot in the mall and i started looking at uh looking out for it and it was it was crazy by the time we uh walked in uh, i think five minutes in i had 10 plus people look at us so i was uh mind blown 
by that. So I think education is so, so key for a lot of people who don't understand what us as black, uh, the black community go through on, on a daily basis because like Jeremy said, walking down the street and seeing someone walk off the street to just get back up, that's, uh, that hurts. And it's, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not a evil person. Jeremy's not an evil person, Mark's not an evil person, but th those people, they don't know that. And I guess that's just the way they've been brought up. So they see guys like us of color and um, we're walking on the street. I can say that these two guys are very bright individuals. They dress very properly. Um, there's nothing to be scared about um, looking at them, but these people still cross the street. We still get followed in malls. You know, um, cops, we still have to fear for our life uh, uh, when uh, cops are around. Like I've had multiple situations where I've been in, uh, like Mark says, where I'm driving by a cop and now I'm looking in my rear view mirror uh, 10 times to make sure that he's not following me now. So it's like um, people need to really understand how crucial this stuff is, how, how much disbelief we were in when we see situations like this. Because they, they heard, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, it's not nice when uh, someone crosses the street when you're, you're ahead of them and then you turn back and they're literally get right back on the sidewalk. That isn't, we're human as well. And this is why we're fighting for these rights. And that's why these protests are taking place right now worldwide. Yeah, thank you for yeah. sharing that. You know, I, I want to ask you a little bit about the sport that we're involved in in a minute as well. But I do think, Mark, let me come to you. You know, I saw you nodding your head there with the interracial relationships there with which you were saying. And I know that's something that you certainly can relate to. You can talk as little, as little or as much as you want about that. That's your own personal life. But for someone who looks like me, um, I've heard people who look like, like me say lately, a lot of people say, I'm not racist. You know, yeah. I'm not racist. That feels for me, that doesn't feel enough. I don't know what you think about that. For me, it's about more than that. Is it not about moving the decision to being anti-racist? For me, that's the next step. How do you feel about that? And, 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 and please, if you feel free to, to, to expand on Richie's point. Yeah, no, obviously, just being not racist isn't good enough. Um, that's for all of us. You know what I mean? That's not just for the black community. That's for every human being on earth. And I, I, when Richie was talking, I was just thinking about for the last hundreds of years, the message to America and the message to the world has been so toxic about the black community, whether it be portrayed in the media, movies, books, anything, it's just bad. Like, it, I'm not surprised people think like this because where do they go to get all their news? The TV or people go to movies and I see it and I'm just like, I don't get how movie producers and directors can always get these these parts to be allowed in, in shows and, and movies where it's just showing, it's just degrading to the black community. And it's like, they're all thugs. They all live in ghetto communities. They're not educated. And people think this, people think this. They wanna think stuff from movies that are that's more believable. They're not gonna think sci-fi, but if they see someone shooting someone and it's a black guy getting caught for it, then they're gonna think about that. Whether they consciously have made the decision to believe that, it's imprinted in their mind. Then when it's on the media and the news, it's always blown up. I've seen so many non-black people commit heinous crimes. And they, it's almost like they get glorified for it in a way. It's like, oh my God, no, you know, it's an insane case. This kid didn't mean to go shoot up the schools. He didn't mean to do that. He didn't mean to rape this girl. He didn't mean, and it's like, it's terrible. And the way they get dealt with, <laughs> you can, like the way with George Floyd, $20 bill counterfeit, a kid who raped a girl behind the, uh, uh, a garbage disposal did not get handled like that. So I, I don't understand, it's bad. It, it's, 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 it's brainwashing. America. That's what it is. And, and that's why I said when Jeremy said it's a marathon, it's going to be a long battle because <laughs> to change that, it's, there's a lot of powerful people in those industries, you know what I mean, who are making millions and millions of dollars on all these stories. They're not going to give that up free willingly, you know? So um, I, I just see it as there, there's a huge problem. This is like a small part of it, but if we cannot get a hold of what gives people news and what gives people ideas and ideologies and then the battle is, is even harder so that's what personally what i think and then on richie's point i i actually told this to my girlfriend that yeah sometimes we're gonna get looks like she is a white american girl you know what i mean and i i don't 
I, I'm not okay with it. I, I'm okay to get by without it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure Richie, you see it and you're just like, wow. Like, you know, it's another person. You can go on with your day with it. Because we understand that if it's someone has the audacity to give you a look because of that, like, there's a lot of things they need to figure out in their life, you know? And you try not to worry about that so much. But yeah, these are little things that happen all the time. And and it sucks. And, you know, we're the generation who's going to change it. And, you know, generations before have suffered way more than we have. And like, like we're all preaching, like it's the education, but it's also how people are going to be taught. And I think the media and movies and TV shows have the big impact in that. I'm going to carry off. I'm going to carry off on that. Sorry. Me too. Um, the, the reason why, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with our portrayal. You know, there's a joke within the black community that we're always dying first in movies and, and TV shows, but uh, it's the reality. And, and it's just that black lives are the most expendable in entertainment. Uh, it's, it's something that people are starting to grapple with and try to change. But, you know, for a long time, that, that was a fact. Um, and, and the issue with how corporate structures are making these decisions about how to portray black people is because there are no black people or there are very limited black people at the top of these structures because they've been barred. From, from ascending the, the corporate capitalistic ladder. Uh, and so when, when we are addressing decades and centuries of race conscious legal measures that have barred black people from tr participating in society in public and private life, it is impossible to, to move forward saying that, you're, that we are gonna atone as a society without having a race conscious solution. And what we've seen in the late 1900s was that, you know, we, we will have race neutral policies that will level the playing field and equalize everything, and there will be no more complaints. But when you have 400 years of, of state sanctioned discrimination, it is impossible to think that all of a sudden just lifting this, the, the, the measures is going to even it out. People have gotten head starts. People have moved into their segregated community so that they can go to their highly funded schools. You know, people have created uh, immovable structures and, and ultimately you're always gonna have a few exceptions, people that climb, the, climb to the top, namely, you know, former President Barack Obama, and people are gonna hide behind that to say society has moved on, society is post-racial. And, and that, is, that is ridiculous, frankly. And it's gonna take a monumental race conscious and I'm gonna say it, reparations to address what is going on in this country. And, and frankly, around the world, but you know, we have to focus on, on the US right now. Um, and to your point about not being not racist, that's certainly not enough. People only say that to excuse whatever racist uh, language or action they're about to, they're about to tell you. Um, and, and the example I'll say is uh, in, in education systems as well, New York City's public schools look as segregated as they've ever had. Uh, and the New York Times and Nicole Hannah-Jones does a really good job of documenting that. Uh, and you know, the self-proclaimed progressive liberals who claim they're all for creating an equitable system are the same ones trying to bar black children from, from having their fair chance at getting into those schools. Uh, and they hide it behind the guise of, oh, we don't want low income people in our schools are, oh, we don't know like how it's gonna affect our child's upbringing. And, you know, the truth comes out. The truth really does come out. And, and so we need to be honest and people need to self-reflect because it's easy to post about who you can donate to right now and point the finger at someone or someone else. But when are people gonna realize that they've been upholding the very system that, uh, they claim to be for dismantling. That's the question that I ask people who come up to me after my piece and say, that was so powerful, I'm moved. Well, is that gonna change your vote from, from Trump to, to the Democratic platform? And if it's not, then you're not moved and you know, we're, we're still not, you can, you can have felt the piece, but you're ultimately not on our side. And you know, whatever not a racist means is not enough to me in that case. Great point. Um, so many great points. I, I want to move the conversation briefly just to, to near the end that we go here about soccer. And as I said earlier, this is certainly not about me, um, but I do want to share a story that impacted me actually over the last couple of weeks. 
Um, Alfonso Davies is a big star in, 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 the, in the soccer world right now. Um, obviously, teammate on the national team with Richie and Mark. And I've done a lot of work on TSN about Alfonso Davies' play for Bayern Munich over the last few weeks. And I said something on TSN a couple of weeks ago. At the time, I didn't think anything of it. And I said, a lot of people were talking about his athleticism and his speed and what it brings to the team. Uh, but I actually went out of my way and I just said, when I'm watching him, just as a soccer analyst, when I'm watching him right now, I want to praise his decision making and his confidence and his intelligence on the field. And I didn't think about it when I said it. And then somebody actually messaged me actually within the industry. And, and they said, that was actually something that was very important for you to say about a black man. And I didn't understand at the time and think about it because I literally didn't think of it that way. But they had a conversation with me and I think it was a very good one about how black athletes, not just in soccer, but are sometimes stereotypes in terms of how analysts and reporters and the media cover them. And I wanted to ask that out to you. You three can talk about it a lot more than I can talk about it. That was just a story that I went through. Richie, I'll turn to you first. Is that something that you think uh, has happened to you or you continue to see in the media the stereotypes towards a black athlete about physical attributes necessarily, not necessarily about other things that are just as important? Yeah, I think that's the first thing people turn to when they uh, they look at black athletes. Like, oh, look how much ground we can cover. Look how strong he is. Look how fast he is. And like, you put it perfectly. Um, Alphonse is playing at a super high level right now, and he can't be there just on the sheer speed and uh, strength. If, if, if that was the case, we'd have hundreds and thousands of um, different type of players in Europe and and all these other places. I think that is, um, yeah, it is. I, I don't know if I could say hurtful, but I think it is to an, to an extent where people just think it's like, oh, he's fast, he's strong, but like there's a there's an end product there. He's making great passes, he's um delivering things on platters for world class players. So yeah, for me, I, I think it's not it's not fair to just look at uh black athletes across the board as just being big and strong or fast, but like you have to have um some type of good IQ for the game in order to be making these type of decisions at a very high level, at a very high pace. And he's, he's shown it. And it's great to see him playing at such a high level. For one, he's a, he's a young black guy. His story is incredible. And then to just see the level that he's playing at and for everyone to see, and especially during these times, it's like, for me, it's like a break. I, I, I get a break every uh, uh, once a week. I turn on the TV and I watch him and I get to smile for, for 90 minutes uh, and I forget about all the madness and craziness we're dealing with in the world today. So, um, I, yeah, I, I think that's a very good point for whoever brought that to It's extremely crucial, especially for um, for black athletes. I, I think I've had this conversation with Mark numerous amount of times. We're roommates with the national team and we always say, that we're like, there's, there's more to us. It's not just he's strong or he's fast you look at mark he has those attributes but then on the ball as well he can make things happen for his teammates or he can make it happen by himself and he showed it for uh numerous amount of years now so i think uh whoever said that to you um big shout outs and a, and a, and a pat on the back to them because that is um spot on to be honest uh, yeah I mean, you don't have to tell me that about mark football intelligence is <laughs> as i've often said about that in the canadian media here mark let me give you an opportunity to respond to that what i that, what i was saying please yeah, no, obviously, um, this has been instilled in our head since I can remember, since being young soccer players, where, you know, you have to, for us, he's fast, he's strong, he's big, you know, and you, I can only speak on my behalf. I went through certain times where that's all a coach was looking for out of me, and it, it, I, a lot of doors got closed because of that. I remember when I was in high school and I was getting ready to go to college. I think I might have been my first year at York. I was looking to transfer to a big uh, D1 school in the States. And they told me exactly what they were looking for. When they came to see me, they didn't say there was anything wrong with me. They were just saying, we're looking for a big black striker. That's what they said. And I was like, well, I, I'm black, but I'm not big. You know what I mean? So when I heard that, I was like, these guys already know what they want. And it's just based off this fake, like, characteristic that they think brings success. Like, I, I don't know how many people think that actually drives success in the game. It's terrible. So I obviously held myself to a level where I needed to be smarter. I want to be one of the smartest players on the field. It doesn't matter how fast I am, 
doesn't matter how strong I am. I just wanted to be smart. And I even saw that in my time at TFC. I saw all these kids come in who I'm trying to improve my IQ. And the only thing they were looking at me was how quick can you run? How, how much stronger can you get? And I couldn't do that. So I lost out opportunities. And I'm blatantly, I could easily sit down with people who are at TFC and say, this is one of the reasons why I didn't make it. But now you look at me now and you get a coach who's football oriented with the game and everything. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing well, you know? So yeah, it sucks when that's the only thing people think about, you know? And it, it's, I think a lot of us have done a good job to put it in the back of our head and work on what we can work on and just focus on the positives. But <laughs> to hear it, you know, it's almost like I don't hear it anymore. It's there, you know, but, um, uh, I, I've tried to work on it and just ignore that fact. But I'm sure, Jeremy, I'm, you know, I'm sure you've gone through your fair share of people saying stupid like that to you too. Let, so. let me just say, let me just say before Jeremy starts, I just wanted to say this. Like I said, I have a very, very small part in this whole thing. But it's my mission and my motto to you to not allow that to be in the back of your head. Let's put it in the front of our head and let's address it head on going forward. We're going to all talk okay. about this and we're going to have these conversations more and more because we can. I can play a small part in that, but we, this, is, this is the reason why we're all sitting here today. This is the reason why I brought that conversation up. And I just want to let you know, you don't need to put that in the back of your head. We're all here for you, okay? Uh, Jeremy. Appreciate right. that. Before, before even Jeremy goes, I think... Um, for us as well, I think it's not a terrible thing for us to be um, athletic and um, strong and stuff like that because that does add to our game. It's not. It's definitely not a terrible thing. And I think if you watch Mark play and you watch Jeremy play, they're obviously extremely talented players, but then they also can add that to the game. So for us, for us it's a plus. It, it makes it even more dangerous and more of a um, higher pedigree than others because Jeremy's able to skip by a few guys and then – you know, I'll muscle a defender and then he scores a goal. Same with Mark. Mark's able to get by a few guys and then use his strength and his speed to then get by a last guy to make a a last um last pass or last play for his team to get a to get a goal. So it's not definitely not a terrible thing, but it shouldn't be the only thing that we're associated with is where I'm right. I think yeah, I think what Richie just said it nails it. You know, we embrace you know, the athletic qualities that we do have, uh, when we do have them, we just don't want to be reduced to that. Uh, that that's what it comes down to. Uh, and I think since a young age, people have seen, you know, black, and they've translated that to athletic. So they've translated that to, he can play any position on the field. So I was playing left back, I was playing left mid, I was playing striker, you know, if I need <laughs> Frankly, if I need to play goalie and dive across the ball, I'm probably going to at a young age, too. Um, and, and those, the perception translates to, you know, the versatility. Um, and, and so that carries into the professional game as well because, you know, whoever is looking at you does have this perception of you as well. And that fits how, at times, they're going to ask you to play. And sometimes it's, it's hard if you don't, if you don't have that, uh, that capability that these people already have deemed that you do have, it's very hard to learn how to do so. Um, you know, I, I'm not slow, but I'm not, not the fastest guy out there. And I'm not weak, but I'm also certainly not the strongest guy out there. I've been in the weight room with guys. I've seen how much weight they put up. You know, I've seen how fast people are running with our GPS data. And I know where I match up. But the way some people have talked about me growing up and at different levels, you would think that I was a freak athlete when in reality I'm not. And I, I just pick my time, my times to attack space. I pick my positions to, to try and body defenders to give myself the best chance. Uh, because ultimately, you know, I'm not, and I'm going to compare myself to Adi because that was the first player uh, that I competed with when I got to Portland. Uh, I'm not 6'3", and however much he weighs, and I'm not going to hold defenders up like he is. But what I will do is I'll be a little bit more mobile. Uh, I'll be able to find spaces in between lines. Uh, and, and I'll be able to dribble the way that I want to dribble as opposed to, you know, being an absolute terror for any center back who's trying to get close to him uh, and, and his ability to spin defenders off. And I think that people coming to accept that about us in our respective positions 
uh, allows us to play a little bit more freely and gives us a chance to be ourselves before people superimpose whatever idea they have um, of what we're supposed to do. And, you know, I think that the more they've watched us play, the more that uh, they've accepted that we're not necessarily the, the, the stereotype that they, that they had envisioned to begin with. Uh, and that there is, uh, there are intricacies to our games, whether it's just the timing or the movement or understanding the flow of other people. Um, these little things, not every player has, frankly, and and we have them to some degree, uh, and, and that should be valued as much as the athletic plays that we might make from time to time. Uh, but for the record, I'll I'll claim myself as the highest jumper in the league. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to. You're allowed to. That's perfect. Uh, great to see everyone smiling. Listen, uh, you've all been really good and consciously. I'm conscious about time. So I just have a couple of questions quickly uh, before we wrap this up. How's it been now you're back training with your teammates about these discussions? Uh, Jeremy, I know Steve Clark was quoted this week about how he was happy to have that kind of safe discussion with you, your teammate in Portland. How have those discussions been? And do you think that those discussions can be more and more positive going forward that we can have more and more of these discussions that, as I said earlier off the top of the show, we can continue this discussion for, for forever rather than just for now. Yeah, I think these conversations just need to keep going consistently. They don't have to be two hours long, you know, for a week straight. But, you know, anytime I say something about race, it shouldn't be dismissed. That's, that's the biggest thing. Uh, in the past, they'd been dismissed or people had told me I was being dramatic. Now, now, now they just need to listen and ask questions or opine if they feel comfortable to do so. Um, Steve has been, you know, one of the one of the few people uh, in Portland that has always been receptive to that kind of conversation. And not only that, but he's taken initiative in his life, uh, even in the face of, you know, uh, a different upbringing than I had, uh, to understand, to empathize, and to work towards uh, work within the system to to make some some things right uh so steve's been a great teammate on and off the field and you know there are, there are a few others on my team who have been like that and i i'm excited for uh the potential to open this up to the whole league and, and that kind of conversation yeah great me too richie how about you what, what's it been like with you in, in toronto and i know michael's been quite vocal michael bradley obviously chose the after on social media how's it been with with your teammates during this time you know, it's actually been uh, it's been different class from all all the guys at Toronto FC because we've had as a group we've had Zoom calls with Ali Curtis, Bill Manning, Greg Vanny, entire coaching staff, and all the players. So it's been it's been really good, and I think everyone really understands that there's a really big problem here. So I was honestly blown away by how um, how intensely everyone's taken this situation. No one's taking it lightly. So it's been extremely nice to see from Toronto FC as a black player, it's really helped me a lot because a, a lot of the guys on the team are now asking questions. They're open to discussions, and every, everyone's talking about this, so it's great. I didn't know which way to go, and I'm not going to lie to you. Once all of this broke in the, uh, uh, on the news, I, I was I was pretty interested to see how my team took it, and it's been it's been nothing short but of amazing because all the guys have been on board. The coaches have been on board, GM, president. We've, we're just having open discussions, and they, it's, it's really good, and they're asking us how we feel and how it's like and what like you know what what we're going through on a day-to-day -day basis and a lot of uh, or not a lot all the black players have been extremely vocal so it's been it's been perfect they're listening we're speaking and it, it feels like we're really getting somewhere with this fantastic mark you're a you're a part of a first class organization i would imagine it's pretty much the same for you yeah no it's been good i think uh obviously having bob at the the forefront of everything it, it makes it a lot easier for us as a club to get our message across. Uh, you know, then you go and you look at our supporters who, you know, are, are getting out there on the protests and adding, you know, in their voice to, to, to something that matters. But also from my team, teammates standpoint, um, you know, my team is very foreign. Um, you know, there are language barriers. You know, I think my team is like 70% international players, something like that. And, um, you know, I'm not too worried about them in this moment right now. Um, I know there will be a time when we will talk about um, certain topics. But, you know, they've gone through a situation where, you know, Dio went through a little situation uh, actually when we were playing against Portland. And, um, you know, just how all the guys in the changing room had his back. 
so I know where they stand. I know that obviously they do need to be educated more, but it's on my part to speak up more and get them to, you know, start this conversation. But um, yeah, from a standpoint, I think they, they understand what's going on and we will continue to work together as a team to make sure that all the ideas are clarified. Let me follow up, Mike. You just said it's on you to speak up a little bit more. I know here in Canada it was big news with obviously the NHL, the hockey players created the, uh, you know, the Hockey Diversity Alliance, which is a little independent from the NHL. They want to have their own say in certain things. But do you think that might – I know football and soccer world is an international global game, but is that something that you think maybe some MLS players might want to get to and, and, and create something similar? 100%. I think everyone is – understanding of what power of influence they have and will take any opportunity to, to create good in the world. So, um, yeah, I, I have full belief that, you know, there will be some MLS player driven initiative to make sure that, you know, we can start creating uh, more light on this situation, but also more awareness for people who don't know and just to create a safer space for everyone. Jeremy, your thoughts on something like that? Is that would that be something that you would be interested in, in creating? Yeah, I think through, we've all been having these experiences on our own. And although we know that these, we're not isolated in these experiences, we, we've chosen to deal with it largely uh, within the people that are closest to us. But now I think that there's the opportunity for us to, to unite in, in one voice. How that manifests itself is to be determined. As we've said multiple times, this is a marathon, uh, so we don't need to rush anything. But uh, we, we're in a moment right now where uh, – the world uh, is ready for our voice where in the past it, it wasn't quite so. And so we'll, we'll navigate those waters as they come. You mentioned ready for your voice. I was ready for your voice. I've been ready for your voice for a long time. I can't thank you, the three of you enough for your voice today and for the time that you've given me and our viewers. Uh, you're a credit to yourselves, your families, the black community, Major League Soccer as well. So thank you so much for spending some time with me to discuss these moments these days. And as I said, this is just the beginning. We're going to continue the as well. Uh, you know where you can find me, and uh, let's continue this. So, with you guys, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.